Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates here at Ausbiz. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Great to be back here for another Watchlist Wednesday, our favorite time of the week. Yep. And we've uh, all this week, we've been speaking to Michael Frazis from Frazis Capital Partners. Yep. Uh, He's been sharing a lot of knowledge with us and I'm pumped to hear about three stocks on his watch list. Absolutely. We've been talking about 100 baggers all week and so uh, expecting big things from this one, Michael. Uh, no pressure, but absolutely welcome back to the studio, Michael. It's great to have you. Great. Thanks for having me back on. So uh, watch list Wednesday, the format is always the same. Three stocks on your watch list and we'd love to hear what they do and why they are on your watch list. So let's start with an Australian company and that is Setire. Uh, what do they do and why is it on your watch list? And did Bryce pronounce it right? And did I pronounce it right? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So I spoke to the management. I was saying satire. Apparently it's satire, uh, which I found out recently. The satire is um, it's an online fashion website, which uh, I'm sure some of your your listeners and viewers will be familiar with and have bought something. It's effectively, this, this, it's a fascinating story because, you know, it's, it's over a billion dollars. It's worth over a billion dollars market cap now. It's up five times from where I IPO, you know, maybe a year ago, probably less than a year ago. Um, that was when we first bought as well. And it's really one of those companies that until the IPO had been completely bootstrapped, so funded and supported by, by the founder, who's an extremely in impressive individual. So he went, he basically went around to wholesalers, and I'm kind of simplifying the story, but, and, and it's, it's my understanding of it as well. He went around to wholesalers in Milan and convinced them um, to put their stock on his site um, before he really had one, you know, it's kind of one of those chicken and egg things. So before he could sell anything, he had to get the stock. Um, and as part of that, he convinced them that they would, you know, do the shipping and handle that. And also they would handle the returns. And so it's a very kind of good deal for him, um, but a tough sell initially. And that, that's a tire. So you go to Satire, the average order value is, you know, I, don't, I think seven, $800. It's kind of that high end luxury fashion uh, and it's from wholesalers all around the world. And now they're starting to get into direct. Um, but it's really, as always, it's the results and the execution that impressed us most. You know, like I have no idea of the dynamics of wholesale retail in, in, in the luxury fashion in Europe. You know, it's very hard to understand. What is easy to understand is, you know, they just did 100 mil of revenue. They're growing over 300%. Um, and now the pitch has changed. Now the wholesalers like want to get access to satire because that's where they've got customers. They've managed to tap this vein um, of customers. And I guess we're kind of primed because there's a company called Farfetch, which is worth many times more, um, but is a much bigger company, been around for a while. Other than that, there's very few online luxury um, fashion players. You know, it's one of those few industries, kind of like autos, kind of like real estate. It's very resistant to e-commerce, but just now there's starting to be business models um, that take advantage of the, the internet revolution. And, you know, as a local stock, it's extremely exciting to watch, um, extremely impressive. And, yeah, that's the tire. Oh, one other thing, there's, 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 there's less than 30 employees that, that behind the company. So the efficiency on headcount and, and, and the way they're running their business is just incredible. That is fascinating. Mm. Well, Michael, I'm known as a bit of uh, a fashion expert, so I'll, <laughs> I'll put that one what on my the? watch list. Um, yeah. I'm, I had to I'm buy sure. something. I had to buy something to see. I couldn't. I couldn't find anything that like made sense. You've got no chance. Ren stuff. definitely doesn't have any chance. Yeah, got seven hundred dollars sneakers or something. It was pretty tough going. <laughs> but uh, Michael, we'll move to the next stock. Uh, so we go from Australia. Uh, over to Canada, uh, and the second stock on your watch list is Galaxy Digital. Um, so tell us about the company, what it does, and why it's on your watch list. Sure. So this is a this is a this is a crypto company. Uh, it's kind of like a full service investment bank. They'll do prime broker brokerage. They'll originate deals. They have M and A. They generate fees from that. Um, they've listed uh, crypto ETFs that are rapidly accumulating capital. Um, and they also take principal investments, which is also a fascinating part of the business because they have the best access and the best flow. And I think it's now becoming clear, you know, crypto has been around here for a long time and it's had a lot of, there's a lot of like winters and, and then huge rallies. Um, but now we're starting to see it really revolutionize certain sectors. And I know there'll be a ton of skeptics listen to that, listening to this now, um, still skeptical after all this time. Um, but just one thing I'll draw attention to is just what it's done to art. You know, the fact that digital artists can go and create something 
and then make huge amounts of money selling that in their own lifetime. Like that probably, it's, there's never been a situation like that ever in human history. Art has been like an intrinsic part of, of the human experience, but the artists themselves were generally, you know, certainly from an economic basis, you know, were tortured individuals. You know, they were very rarely got the, got the credit, got, got recognized and, and sufficiently rewarded for the work they were doing. But now the top digital artists, if they got the finger on the pulse, can make um, absolute fortunes. And I think it's just an example of one industry that has actually found an incredible use case uh, that we can all all agree is a good thing. But back to back to this company, so they're kind of sitting in the middle. There's there's a, there's a very small number of institutional quality players. Um, it's kind of like you can't just set up a crypto investment bank and go. I mean, you can, but the best people will always go to the ones that are more established and have been around for a long period of time. And, you know, we, we look for execution, we look for growth and trading volumes increased by 90% of the last quarter. Um, revenues increased by a similar amount, you know, over the last six months. And they made something like a billion dollars on a, on, on a $6 billion market cap. And so you can see some pretty serious value there as well. Interestingly, you know, Coinbase, um, Galaxy, these big crypto exchanges, they're almost the cheapest companies on the market, as well as some of the fastest growing. So I think, I think it's an interesting stock. I think, I think your readers will, would be interested in, in looking at it. And I think of all the different ways to invest in a, what is still a very wild west, um, it's still a very dangerous place to put money. I think it's one of the better ones. Yeah, interesting. So we've had uh, Satire, Galaxy, and now uh, the third on your watch list, Michael, is Avenus. Uh, Venus again, probably pronounced right. it wrong, but uh, <laughs> why is it on your watch list and what does it do? Yeah, so this is a life sciences one. It's a bit of a complicated one, but it's, it's a really fascinating one. They basically work on things called protein degraders, which I will, which I'll explain. So if you think about drug development, typically they're small molecules that kind of like, kind of like wrenches that like hit, like fit in the machinery of like an enzyme. So your body has all kinds of proteins that do all kinds of things. And there'll be like an active site, a tiny little active site. And you'll, chemists will try and make a drug that fits that active site exactly um, in the protein and blocks it. Um, protein, and, and that's the entire paradigm of drug discovery in pharmaceuticals. Almost every drug that's ever been developed uh, operates on that principle. Protein degraders are different. The idea with protein degraders is, well, firstly, your body has this, a system by which it can destroy any protein. And it has ways of being of very specifically finding any protein that gets out of whack and destroying it. Um, and a ton of diseases from Alzheimer's, you know, down um, are caused by misfolded proteins, by aberrant proteins, by excess protein accumulation. Um, what our Venus and the protein degrading companies that we're so excited about can do is they can target proteins for destruction, but they don't go for the active site. They can go for other parts of the molecule. And that means... It's, it's hard to describe how, how revolutionary that would be. But, you know, it means that you don't need, you, you, can, you can target proteins that don't have an active site. It means you, it's enzymatic. So a small amount of this can destroy a protein, then another one, another one, another one. The problem with small molecules is it's generally competitive. If they're competing to get into that little active site. So you have to use high doses and you have to dose people over extended periods of time. Um, and that leads to side effects. And those, ends, those tiny small molecules that fit in those enzymes, generally blast all kinds of different things around your body. Um, these have the promise of being vastly more specific um, and, you know, curing previously untreatable diseases uh, with significantly lower side effects. And that is really exciting. So it reminds us of, of companies like Moderna, the mRNA platforms, companies that build like a platform technology, um, which will then be able to target, you know, countless diseases across the spectrum um, using the same foundational technology, just changing, you know, the linkers, you know, the thing that you actually attach to the protein degrader. Um, it's a real platform, and it's one of those information in biotechnology companies. So you think about mRNA, it's kind of like an information um, treatment now. So if you've got the, the, the right code, you can then create um, an mRNA vaccine. And then the vac to, to get it to, to target something different, you just change the code. Um, in this case, um, you're changing the, the part of the protein it can attach, attach to. So I think it's got all the things we look for. It's a platform. It's super exciting. It has immense promise. If you, you can assess it from first scientific fundamentals, first kind of principles, 
Um, and you can see that it's got immense advantages over existing ways of doing some um, things. And then you can look at the economics. And, you know, if they can improve the treatment for very horrible diseases that are untreatable, they should be able to make a fortune and, and be able to reinvest that in new research and development. Um, so that's our Venus. They're kind of the market leader. Uh, Pfizer put in money about 20% higher than where the stock is now. So it's not a bad time to get in. Uh, and I hope that was interesting. I was trying to keep that simple and <laughs> not, no, you can not understand get too I can, I can understand that it's market leader and uh, quite disruptive growing quickly, but I'm not going to lie that uh, I'm fully across life sciences. Uh, there's no doubt that you are, though. So um, it's one of those sectors of the market that um, in terms of circle of competence, I don't know about you, Ren, but that getting head around biosciences and all the advancements that are happening in there at the space at the moment is um, it's pretty complex. Well, the good news is, Michael, uh, you'll be joining us for tomorrow's episode where we'll be dedicating the whole episode to talking about life sciences. So uh, we appreciate your time today and sharing three stocks on your watch list. Uh, and we can't wait to get stuck into a bigger conversation about life sciences tomorrow. Great. Thanks. Looking forward to it. And that brings us to the end of today's Watchlist Wednesday. A reminder, we had Setire, Galaxy and uh, Venus. And uh, don't hit me up on Instagram if I've pronounced those wrong. <laughs> but um, three companies that no doubt have great or are undergoing huge amounts of growth at the moment um, and are leaders in their field. So check them out if you're interested. But we will be back tomorrow to close out our week with Michael Frazis as we discuss all things biotech. He's got a real specialty in that area. So... I'm hoping to get a bit of clarity around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, see you tomorrow.